My name is Emil Kang, and I'm the executive director for the arts here at UNC. And <laughs> this uh, whole weekend, in fact, this whole coming year is the culmination for us of nearly four years of planning. And um, I can only say thank you to, especially to one person, and that's Professor Severine Neff. Sev, where are you? There you are. Just want to ask you to wave your hand. Thanks. Um, she actually came to my office when we tied this discussion that was mentioned in the film. She came because she wanted to help me to help her find her husband, who was a composer, an agent. And it led all from that to this incredible thing. And um, Severine, I just want to thank you for your belief in us and what we do um, and your vision, not just for, for Schoenberg, but for all of, the, all of the arts that's out there in the world. Thank you, Severine. We really I gave that disgusting face. But you wait and see. Um, I also would like to acknowledge how many of you were at the performance last night? A lot of you. That's wonderful. Uh, I, will of course, need to acknowledge members of the Silk Road Ensemble who are with us this morning. Um, the concert last night, again, I couldn't have thought of a better way to start our season, The Rite of Spring at 100, with this incredible piece, this piece we've commissioned by Dmitry Yanofianovsky, a piece called Sacred Signs. We're also the great beneficiaries that, of another premiere, which uh, we can now claim credit for uh, presenting, and it's by Vijay Iyer, another gentleman who you'll see later on today. Uh, the concert, of course, repeats again tonight. Uh, I encourage all of you who don't have tickets to come with a sign that says, need tickets, out front. And I'm sure there'll be somebody there who can maybe help you out. But uh, it's a great, great evening for us. And I'd like to just acknowledge the whole Silk Road Ensemble, if we can just applaud for them for their incredible time here. We are thrilled to have been able to gather some of the greatest minds and talents around the world here just to discuss this thing called the Rite of Spring. It's, um, uh, it's a great honor for us because today's symposium has also been made possible in part by the Douglas Hunt Lecture Series, and I want to just acknowledge them. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to serve as your host and do my best to try to keep us on track, so to speak. And um, uh, I'll ask for your patience. We're going to try to move through things fairly quickly. Uh, after we hear some brief remarks from our special guest speaker, I'll return to the stage to begin the conversation. Uh, since we have so many uh, voices to hear from, I hope it'll be okay with you if I uh, dispense with introductions. Uh, they have them, you have them in your materials. Feel free to look them up later. But we won't go into the list of, of accomplishments of all these artists, because otherwise, we'll still be celebrating the bicentennial of the Rite of Spring. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that. Just, just, um, I, um, we are thrilled because, as you heard on the film, the essential part of this project is the commissioning of new work. And what we heard last night was the first of 12 new pieces that we've commissioned for this project, Rite of Spring. And we also heard about these conferences that Severine has been charging up. One uh, here in Chapel Hill at the end of October, and another in the spring in, in Moscow. And um, we are incredibly lucky in that from the very beginning we received support from the philanthropy community all around the country, in particular from the Andrew Mellon Foundation, but also from the Keenan Trust and from the National Endowment for the Arts and many individuals, some of you in this room. Um, and we've had incredible support from our provost, our chancellor as well. Uh, I think this project for us represents um, a whole new way forward of thinking for us in the performing arts, and I'll get back to that a little later. Um, it's um, a question people asked us is, how many times am I going to hear the Rite of Spring this year? Am I going to hear it a thousand times? Am I going to get sick of it? Is it crazy? And I try to explain to people that this is not exactly what we're trying to do here. We're not actually looking to uh, present the, the piece from 1913 over and over again. Of course, no doubt, you will see and hear performances of the score, the, the ballet, other interpretations with that original music a few times during the year. But what was important for us in, in looking back that we're actually looking forward in commissioning these new pieces to look at artists today who are creating some of the most interesting work and how we at Chapel Hill can actually take part in enabling and investing in these artists. And that is at the heart of this entire project. And so in the idea of us both looking, the only way for us to look forward is by looking backwards, but it's for us it's still a way for us to keep the ball moving. And it's something I think at Carolina Performing Arts that we've been able to try to 
um, to foster since the very beginning in 2005. And I'm thrilled to say that with this coming year, we'll have commissioned over 37 pieces in the last seven and a half years. And for us, it's a really big honor to have com contributed to our, our field in this little way. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to just acknowledge again the work of, of my counterpart, Severine Neff, who um, I want to introduce to come up here to the stage and introduce our special guest, Severine. I just want to say it's one thing to make a suggestion, it's another thing to have things happen. And I think we should applaud Emil because he's the person who made it happen. In 1967, I was a freshman at Columbia, and a graduate student said he would show me around the music department. And um, he was going to point out people and talk about them. And uh, <clears throat> Richard walked by, Richard Taruskin, and uh, Tom Baker said, um, oh, well, you know, there's Richard. And I said, Richard who? And he said, no, Taruskin, he's a, He's a gamba player, you know, he was a Russian major. He's interested in conducting. And you know, people say he can write. Uh, and all of this was very, very prophetic uh, because Richard indeed became a um, very prominent, very well-respected gamba player with Alice Ensemble. He uh, founded his own group, Capella Nova, is a conductor. He made 15 CDs when he was a performer. And yes, he can write. Uh, the sixth volume, uh, Oxford History of Western Music. His early works on um, opera, Russian opera in the uh, 1860s. And, oh, his many articles on the fallacy of authentic performance practice on Mussorgsky. Uh, in 1977, the Columbia graduate students asked him not to teach, I guess it was on Tchaikovsky, but instead uh, to uh, talk about Stravinsky. And this was really the beginning of his work that culminated 20 years later in the two volume, and people call it magisterial, and it is. Uh, uh, Stravinsky in the Russian traditions. It founded the uh, field of scholarship. Now, for most people, this would be enough. But um, as I mentioned just a little while ago in our other uh, luncheon meeting, that um, Richard is uh, very devoted to spreading uh, knowledge of uh, classical music to a broad audience. And as a result, of course, he has done this as a critic and reviewer for the New York Times uh, and for the New Republic. And um, he also feels strongly, and I used the word moral last time, I'm going to use it again, uh, to be an advocate for art music uh, and its importance, I think, within our culture. It's a great honor and it's a privilege for me to introduce uh, the class of 1955, Professor of Music from the University of California at Berkeley, Richard Taruskin. Well, it's a thrill to be here and a great honor uh, and I have to make this short because we've started late, as you've been told, and I actually have a plane to catch because I have to teach in Berkeley tomorrow. I, I've got a job. Um, <clears throat> and I guess that's something to be happy about these days. Uh, I was a little amused when we saw this video, and the first thing that Emil Kang said was that art brings people together. Well, the Rite of Spring did not bring people together. <laughs> <laughs> at least not at first. And I thought maybe the best way I could get this session started and also the whole year-long celebration of this uh, iconic work of art is to read you a few uh, me me mementos of its very, very famous first performance. 
uh, which was one of the great ruckuses in the history of 20th century music. Uh, this fits in with something else we heard in the video uh, when Dr. McGowan said that um, it was the philosophy of art in the 20th century uh, that the avant-garde artists were uh, antagonistic towards society and baited the non-artistic people. Uh, and so there was a tremendous amount of hostility expressed uh, on both sides of uh, the artwork uh, in the 20th century. This is very much a part of the philosophy of modernism. Uh, and that's another reason why Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, because of its uh, unusual opening night, uh, has become such an icon. But that icon is not terribly, terribly well understood. Uh, I'm opening my Bible now, as you see. This is actually a wonderful dissertation uh, written at the Eastman School of Music in the early 1970s by a scholar named Truman Bullard, uh, who went to the trouble of collecting every review that the Rite of Spring received on his opening night. Uh, and I'm going to read you two, uh, two or three items from this little book. Um, starting with not a review, but the notice of what that was placed in all of the leading Paris newspapers on the morning of May 29th, 1913, the day of the first performance. Uh, this was actually a notice placed by the management of the theater, uh, the Théâtre de Champs Élysées in Paris, which is. Uh, 100 years old, as well as the Rite of Spring. Uh, the Rite of Spring was performed in that theater during its first year of operation, and it was meant as a venue for the most elite and most modern works of art. Uh, and so they had their own propaganda axe to grind. Uh, and they wrote this in the papers the morning of the premiere. Le Sac de Printemps, which the Russian ballet will perform for the first time this evening at the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées, is the most amazing creation ever attempted by Monsieur Serge de Diaghilev's admirable company. It evokes the primitive gestures of pagan Russia as conceived by the triple vision of Stravinsky, poet and composer, of Nicholas Rurich, poet and painter, and of Nijinsky, poet and choreographer. Here we see powerfully portrayed the characteristic attitudes of the Slavic race in its response to beauty in the prehistoric era. Only the wonderful Russian dancers could portray these first stammered gestures of a half-savage community. Only they could represent those frenzied mobs of people who stamp out untiringly the most startling polyrhythms ever produced by the brain of a musician. Here is truly a new sensation which will undoubtedly provoke heated discussions, but will leave every spectator with an unforgettable memory of the artists. Now that's hype, right? <laughs> uh, and of course, hype is already a provocation. Uh, hype already puts you in, on guard. Hype inspires, well, hostility. So what, what do they expect? Uh, and so now I'm going to read you a little bit from one of the reviews um, by a critic named Louis Viemin. Uh, but, uh, this appeared in uh, the newspaper Comedia two days later, May 31st. This is his report of the occasion. It's a lengthy review, so I'm just going to read you two tiny excerpts. Uh, one of them describes the mood in the hall before the performance began, uh, because the hall had been well primed by the hype. Uh, and so as he writes, just you wait, those convinced said, that is those convinced by the hype said, we are about to witness the great musical revolution. This evening is the appointed time for the symphony of the future. Watch out, warned the skeptics. They are out to make fun of us. They take us for fools. We must defend ourselves. Result, the curtain goes up. I should say, even before the curtain went up, you could hear, oh. And then they all began to sing, to hiss, to whistle, and he's not talking about the Russian dancers. Uh, some clapped, 
Some cried, bravo, some shrieked, some cheered, some hooted, some extolled. And there you have the premiere of Le Sac du Printemps. And then he says a little bit further on, and this I think is a very significant quote, and it will color everything that I think anybody's going to say about the uh, Rite of Spring from now till next May. Um, at the end of the prelude, the crowd simply stopped listening to the music so that they might better amuse themselves with the choreography. So in other words, if this review is to be trusted, and actually it agrees with the great preponderance of the other reviews gathered in this book, um, Stravinsky's music was not what incited the riot at the premiere of the right. It was the ugly, ugly choreography by Václav Nijinsky, who of course was the great, uh, uh, the great dancer of the company, uh, universally acknowledged as the greatest male dancer of the, of the day, but who was a bit of a novice as a choreographer and inspired therefore skepticism. He did something very bold uh, at a time when people expected uh, ballerinas to be like swans. Uh, instead, he produced what Stravinsky many decades later looked back on as a chorus line of knock-kneed lalitas, is that, um, <laughs> as he put it. Uh, and the crowd immediately reacted to the sight of the dancers uh, and also to the extremely inelegant, clumsy way uh, in which not only they, but also the one solo dancer or the one with an extended solo, namely the sacrificial victim, uh, was forced to dance uh, in a way that contradicted every aesthetic canon of the ballet. Uh, so they were so offended by that that they reacted vocally and actually drowned out the music uh, at the premiere. So when we read, as we now often do, uh, that hearing this music changed music forever. Well, the Rite of Spring did change music for a while, uh, but it did it later when people could actually hear it. Uh, so that's one thing I think we have to keep in mind, uh, that the music itself was not the main event uh, that night. Uh, and whatever influence the music had uh, came gradually and came later. And uh, the myth that surrounded the opening night has, I think, hidden more than it's revealed about the music. And for my last little number here, I want to read you something that Truman Bullard did not find, did not include in his book, something that I was amazed to discover myself when I was doing a little New York Times search. Um, I didn't know that the New York Times covered the premiere of The Rite of Spring uh, and did it in English. Uh, English of a sort, as you'll see, because what it actually is, is a selective survey of, well, three mainly, uh, of the Paris reviews that are in Truman Bullard's book uh, in rather elegant period translations from 100 years ago. Let me read you the headlines and, and at least part of the article because again you'll see that what was being reacted to was Nijinsky's dancing and not Stravinsky's music and even more than it was a reaction to Nijinsky's dancing it was a reaction to the hype uh, that Diaghilev and his company, and also the management of the theater, the manager being a man named Gabriel Astruc, uh, had placed in the papers. So the headline is, Parisians Hiss New Ballet. Uh, Russian dancers latest offering the consecration of spring. It didn't even have an English name yet. It was being performed as Le Sac du Printemps, so the editors of the Times gave it an English name. Uh, the consecration of spring is a failure. And that is indeed how it was experienced by the performers and by Stravinsky uh, at the time. Uh, it wasn't until a year later, in 1914, uh, that the original conductor, Pierre Monteux, gave the score a concert performance. And that was wildly uh, successful. I mean, you could hear it. Uh, and people really appreciated uh, the qualities of the score that became eventually very influential. Uh, but for a whole year, Stravinsky lived with the idea that he had really uh, had a fiasco and a potentially career damaging fiasco. Um, 
The next uh, subhead is, has to turn up lights. Manager of the theater takes this means uh, to stop hostile demonstrations as dance goes on. Uh, both Stravinsky and Diaghilev in their memoirs recall that it was Diaghilev who turned the house lights on and off. Uh, but actually it was Gabriel Astruc, and as we'll see when I get to that part of this review, uh, this was a very practiced technique of crowd control uh, that they use in the theater. Um, yeah, and so this is uh, exclusives by Marconi Transatlantic Wireless Telegraph to the New York Times. Bluffing the idle rich of Paris to appeal to their snobbery is a delightfully simple matter. Uh, this is a quote from one of the reviews. This is by a man named Alfred Capu, who was a columnist uh, in the Figaro, which was then as now uh, the main political newspaper uh, in Paris. He later became the editor of the Figaro. So this was a big time journalist, not a critic. Um, <clears throat> the only condition precedent thereto is that they be gorged with publicity. So he's making special uh, reference to the hype. Having entertained the public with brilliant dances, he adds, the Russian ballet and Nijinsky now think the time is ripe to sacrifice fashionable snobs on art's altar. The process works out as follows. Take the best society possible, composed of rich, simple-minded, idle people, <laughs> then submit them to an intense regime of publicity by booklets, newspaper articles, lectures, personal visits, and all other appeals to their snobbery. Persuade them that hitherto they have seen only vulgar spectacles and are at last to know what art is and beauty. Impress them with, the, with cabalistic formulas. They have not the slightest notion of music, of literature, of painting, or dancing. Still, they have heretofore been under th uh, these names only a rude imitation of the real thing. Finally, assure them that they are about to see real dancing and hear real music. It will then be necessary to double the prices at the theater. So great will, so great will the rush of shallow worshipers at this false shrine be. This observes Monsieur uh, Capu. They were. Uh, they are, uh, you know, they, they are openly quoting him. This is not their opinion, but his quoted opinion. Uh, this, observes Monsieur Capu, is what the Russian dancers have been doing to Paris. The other night, however, the plan miscarried. The piece was the consecration of spring, and the stage represented humanity. On the right are strong young persons picking flowers, while a woman, 300 years old, dances frenziedly. This is according to the scenario. So he's actually describing the ballet as one who was there. On the left, an old man studies the stars, while here and there, sacrifices are made to the god of light. The public could not swallow this. They promptly hissed the piece. A few days ago, they might have applauded it. The Russians, who are not entirely acquainted with the manners and customs of the countries they visit, didn't know that French people protested readily enough when the last degree of stupidity was reached. <laughs> In conclusion, Monsieur Capu warns Parisian snobs not to make fools of themselves by going into ecstasies over the Polish actors. Oh, this is another thing. He's uh, now. Since Monsieur Capu's article, there have been disorderly scenes at the Champs-Élysées Theater where the Russian ballet is appearing. The consecration of spring was received with a storm of hissing. The manager, Monsieur Astruc, and now they're shifting over to a paraphrase from an interview with Astruc that was published in the aftermath of the Reich premiere. Uh, Mr. Astruc, however, has devised a novel method for silencing a demonstration. When hisses are mingled with counter cheers as they were the other night, Monsieur Astruc orders the lights turned up. Instantly, the booing and hissing stop. Well-known people who are hostile to the ballet do not desire to appear in an un undignified role. So you can imagine that they turn up the lights, everybody got quiet. When they got quiet, they turned the lights off. Everybody started hiss hissing and hooting again, and they turned the lights on, everybody got quiet. It was almost like Pavlov and his dogs, you know, uh, that night in Paris. 
And now, finally, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at the next to last paragraph of this whole column long article. And that next to last paragraph, Igor Stravinsky, oh yeah, he was there too. Uh, Igor Stravinsky, who wrote the music of the Consecration of Spring, says that the demonstrations are a bitter blow to the amour propre of the Russian ballet dancers, who are sensitive to such displays of feeling and fear they may be unable to continue the performances of the piece. So you see, there was no bravado. They didn't feel proud of having antagonized the audience. They felt actually fearful that this would be the end of their enterprise. Uh, and that is all we get, added Monsieur Stravinsky, after a hundred rehearsals and a whole year's hard work. The composer, however, is not altogether pessimistic, for, he adds, no doubt it will be understood one day that I sprang a surprise on Paris, and Paris was disconcerted, but it will soon forget its bad temper. And it did, a year later, uh, but not at the ballet, only in concert performance, and that is really the reason why <coughs> the Rite of Spring has really existed more as a concert piece than as a ballet over the century since Stravinsky's time, but this uh, since the first performance. But you know, this really shows uh, how much of a myth the story of the Rite of Spring is. Uh, however, I'm not trying to appear here as merely an academic pest who likes to debunk the myths we love. Uh, we have a good reason to cherish our myths uh, because it gives us occasions like this, when we can actually come together uh, and declare together our interest in and our love for these great works of art that have had these very checkered careers, which is now our great good fortune and our pleasure uh, to try to understand as they really were, rather than as the embroidery of a century has made them look. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Teruskin. Um, we um, have tried to organize this session in three groups. Um, the groups somewhat are somewhat arbitrary, so you'll have to just beg, beg my pardon, beg our pardon here, please. But um, we've organized them in terms of music, movement, and imagery. And so I'd like to invite our first guests, um, Colin Jacobson, Yo-Yo Ma, and Alistair Willis. We love PRO, by the way. Please. So I think the best thing would be for us just to, just to get going. Obviously, we've had a great um, look back into history, uh, thanks to Dr. Taruskin, about both what was fact and fiction about the Rite of Spring. Uh, I think this is now a great chance for us not to only look back, but to look forward and to say, how does uh, the legacy uh, like one created by Stravinsky influence new work that's being made today. And I think that's the context in which we'd like to have our conversations with you all. Um, and I'd like to, of course, if I could, start with Colin, perhaps. Uh, Colin, um, as many of you may know, is a member of the Silk Road Ensemble, also an incredible composer in his own right. And we have commissioned uh, the string quartet that he's also a part of, Brooklyn Rider, uh, on a whole evening of work, including a couple of new works uh, one by yourself, Colin, and um, perhaps maybe you can just, we can start by, I can ask you by talking a bit about the construction of this evening uh, and how you think it might relate to the legacy that we've just learned so much about. Um, yeah, well, uh, I think we took the idea, the modernist mantra of uh, Ezra Pound, make it new, as just our, what is, you know, as, as the touchstone for right. what that evening will be. Um, of course, what does it mean to make it new? And, and I think as a quartet, um, which is a very old form um, living today, I think that's a very different thing than maybe it was in Stravinsky's time. Right. Uh, I mean, we've seen 100 years of um, experimentation that maybe was started really at that time. And um, so in honoring the time that this piece was written in, we're doing Bartok's second quartet and Stravinsky's um, three pieces for string right. quartet. 
So basically from that same period and you know, very much exploring um, a lot of the, the similar themes that, that Stravinsky and ma maybe many visual artists were looking as, you know, as we've talked about to primitive sources right. um, and um, going way back in time in order to have a sense of, of um, making something new. And then of course, as you said, we're, we're really excited to, to bring new pieces to light um, as part of that. And I think in terms of music that, that we like to play, it, it, it is that. It's about saying, um, you know, the four of us have different tastes, different ideas of, of what we like. And we, we, with a quartet, you have the possibility of exploring those interests. So um, we're working with a wonderful singer named Shara Warden, um, who's classically trained, has a very pure, beautiful voice, and spends a lot of her time as a singer-songwriter called My Brightest Diamond. Um, and she, so I'm writing a piece for her and quartet. And this is really um, the first time I'm writing an extended song cycle. Mm. And so in terms of just the, the sense of what does it mean to um, stretch yourself, which I think is, is something Stravinsky was doing, that's a stretch for me. In turn, she's writing a piece for the quartet, and she's never written an instrumental-only piece. So you've taken a chance on us, maybe like uh, you know, Diaghilev in some sense, but I think that um, there's a, a lot of shared affinities there in terms of we love her music, we love her singing. I, I've been listening to her voice, and I'm so excited to respond to that simple um, physical aspect of her voice in the context of um, Kandinsky's sounds. So that's the text I'm using, wow, which, was, which also is from that period. It was published in 1913. And um, you know, he's, a, he's a painter, mostly we know him as, but he wrote all these poems at that time because he was interested in sort of theater and, um, and actually those poems point the way to sort of Dada and, and taking words and stripping them of obvious meaning. And they're very funny, they're very whimsical, they're very beautiful and strange. And um, there's a line that Kandinsky used when I, I've been looking at, at some of his writings about theater and uh, um, from the Blue Rider Almanac, um, because our name Brooklyn Rider is derived in part from the Blue Rider group. We just were inspired by that sense of cross-pollination that was going on at that time in this, at the same time as the Rite of Spring, but in this other world in Munich. And you know, Kandinsky, Schoenberg, um, Franz Marc, many people were part of that um, simultaneous looking for, for how, to, how to push art forward. Right. And um, so it, I've, I've been having a great time working with those words. And I think the sense of Kandinsky I mean, it, it, it appeals to me because I'm, I'm a violinist mainly. I, I have been enjoying writing music ever since being part of the Silk Road Ensemble, um, something I studied in high school but then went away from. And, um, and a lot through the exposure to the music of Kehan and Wuman and many people, my ears were opened and I felt like guilty not to do something with that. So um, I've been trying to do something with that ever since. And um, so anyway, that's sort of the result. Gabe Kahane is another part of that program. He's a wonderful person who also straddles sort of the pop world and classical world. His father is Jeffrey Kahane. He's a wonderful singer songwriter and someone who's a very talented composer as well. And um, he's writing something called The Fiction Issue. All the lyrics are original for that. And that also involves Shara, the quartet, and him. Um, so we're really excited about that. Do you want to game. mention, just lastly, the bit with uh, John Heckenbotham oh, as yeah, well? Oh, yeah. And so the, the, since we're part of the music portion, but this is music and image and movement, um, a good friend of mine, John Higginbotham, who's um, a dancer uh, who had been with Mark Morris for around 15 years, um, has always done his own choreography on the side and recently has formed his own company, Dance Higginbotham. And he uh, is working alongside me for the piece that we're creating, which we're calling Chalk and Soot. And um, uh, he, I think he's taking some of his cues from the book of poems because Kandinsky provided um, illustrations that are kind of these dreamy woodcut prints and they're beautiful. And um, 
and John's, John's a wonderful dancer and choreographer, and, and we're really looking forward to what that piece will be in November. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, if we can turn now to the Silk Road Ensemble, the, uh, I think, Colin, you sort of took the words out of my mouth. One of the hallmarks, I think, of all the commissions that we've supported for this year have all been collaborations uh, based on either in the creation and definitely in the, in the presentation aspect of it all. And I think for us, that also is a very direct reference to the Rite of Spring and its premiere, that it was a collaboration by all these individuals back in 1913. Um, and I guess maybe I'll start with you, Alistair. Uh, you, of course, conduct sacred signs. That is your, your duty, uh, quite a big one, that I might add. Um, when I received a copy of the score the other day, um, it made a gigantic thud on my desk when I dropped it. Um, it is 363 pages. Uh, I'm not sure how big Mahler scores are, but I'm sure it's probably pretty close. Um, Alistair, I think, I guess the question to you is, as a conductor who's not part of the ensemble, but as someone who's being asked to uh, not just, of course, uh, keep it all together, but to impart your own sensibilities to the work, how you approached this score, uh, Dimitri's aesthetic, and of course your knowledge of, of the ensemble? What a great question. Um, as a conductor of orchestras, uh, I think there's not enough time to have 100 people in the orchestra give their opinion on how things should go, and that's why the, the conductor exists. Somebody has to make the decision. But with the Silk Road Ensemble, it's a different kettle of fish. It's a different experience for me. Uh, these musicians are all unbelievable in their own right, coming, to get right, uh, <laughs> coming together. And we have time in our rehearsals to hear each other's points of view. And we've got to make sure that we can hear across the stage, we can hear in our monitors the right instrument at the right time, and to listen to each other. The conductor's job, really, on any level, is to make sure that we're all listening. And the listening going on in this group is just amazing. I've been honored to do two other pieces of Dimitri's with the Silk Road Ensemble. And what makes them unique as far as I'm concerned, is that he involves groups of music musicians who can read music, who are, as we call, paper trained, like, uh, <laughs> like meaning that you can read music. It's, it's, it's a common term. Uh, um, uh, they can read music, and they know what a conductor is. <laughs> and you have other musicians who are uh, brought up in the folk tradition, right. and they don't read music. And who's that guy waving his arms telling us what to do? And so. It's a, it's a level of collaboration which doesn't exist in my day job as music director of the Illinois Symphony Orchestra. Right. And I'm having to come up with new ways of expressing what the composer needs so that they can be translated by, uh, they can be understood by people who don't read music, know when to come in, know what to play. And this job is taken on by all of us. We're all in this together. It's very much a, a collaborative conductor experience for me which makes it unique and very special. I, of course, I just also need to ask you, in terms of you as a conductor, I presume you've conducted the Rite of Spring, the actual score, many yes. times as well. Yes. Um, do you have any sort of uh, any wisdom you'd like to share about your own interpretations of that? I don't know if we have time for that, <laughs> but uh, my, one of my, um, of course, the last three minutes used to be some of the hardest conducting patterns. To um -cha, um -cha, um -cha, ba -ba -ba. It's all twos and threes, and if you miss one, or if a player comes in wrong, the riot could happen within the orchestra, let alone <laughs> in the audience. And, and conductors used to sweat about this. The first time I had to do this in a conducting studio, I mean, I didn't sleep. I didn't want to make a mistake. And, and you realize it's not just up to you. Maybe if a musician makes a mistake and it's not your fault and it goes wrong, well, it's not your fault. And uh, it just is a mess. And well, you'll take the blame for it. Um, but it's become so standard now. I mean, teenagers are conducting this from memory now. <laughs> and it's what was once the impossible, the bar, has now gone away. And is that a good thing? Well, I think <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the big picture of art, to always be uh, stretched and to, to bring people together to experience new things and to challenge them, I think, yeah, it's a good thing. That's wonderful. Thank you, Alistair. Yo-Yo, um, where do we begin? So when we first, <laughs> when we um, first discussed this, I, I heard from the ensemble that the, the ensemble as a group was interested in pursuing their long-term relationship with Dmitry Yanofyanovsky. Uh, perhaps 
you can just share with, with us some of that history and um, with the ensemble. And of course, I think for me, how an ensemble of all these different instruments comes together to create something that's much larger than any one of those instruments. Um, and if you think that uh, the ensemble, and this is how kind how of my own view, uh, is this idea of one foot in the past, one foot in the future, how you balance all these things. Sorry. <laughs> well then. <That> was... <laughs> um, well, let's take what you started off with. I, I love the way you're thinking about um, how you take something that you create in the present by looking in the past and that, that actually catapults you into uh, a future way of thinking. Um, in terms of what, what you've done, in terms of all of the new works that you're creating, and what is it, 16 courses? 18. 18 courses that somehow have to do with understanding, in many ways, what the conditions were that made the right of spring possible. So, so on the one hand, you, you have uh, Chancellor Thorpe teaching a course on entrepreneurship. Um, and you look at Diaghilev in Paris in 1911 to 13 making his troop survive, right, in Paris. And you, could, you look at those elements. My father, by the way, was born in 1911, so he was two when The Rite of Spring was first performed. And I know, and I was born in Paris, so the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées is, you know, it's my old stomping grounds. And so I think, so personally, I'm thinking, you know, what made my father leave China to go to Paris in 1936. And I, I, I've wondered that for many, many years. And, and I think the answer that I'm getting is that uh, Paris was, an, was the New York of the early 20th century. Everybody who was interested in anything went there for art, for politics, for, for culture. That was, that was the feeding ground. For, so why, was, why were the French so interested in Russia? And why was French, why were Russians so interested in France? Why was uh, French the diplomatic language? You know, so you look at those conditions, and I, I, I think understanding those pre preconditions that made for that thing to emerge is something that you, you know, I'm personally interested in over and over again. And that's something, in fact, what you're all interested in. That's why we have the research triangle. <laughs> Seriously? You're gathering people. You know, your chance was given doing a course on entrepreneurship. You're actually trying to not just create new artworks, you're trying to get people to think and to be in the state where new things and original thought, as was, was talked about um, in the video, how those things are going to come together, which means looking at old models and old successful models. And, and regardless of what um, Professor Toreskin was saying in terms of the reviews, this was a lasting model that actually did change. And, and what I think what ties what you're doing with what Colin's doing and what Alistair's doing and what, what the Silk Road Project's doing is that we all find that the interesting things that happen are at the intersections. And so it's, it was that during that time, it was at the intersections of society, you know, France, Russia, uh, and then obviously mixing and collaborating, having an entrepreneurial person in Diaghilev, always going to all the composers and, and to, to say, do this with me. An unbelievable success story. He, he's like one of the great cultural entrepreneurs of all time. And, 
and, and, and successful, but he was also in danger of always losing it all, which in the end, I think all the Ballet Russe collection is in the Hartford Museum right. because they ran out of money. Uh, so that's a lesson in itself too. Uh, what Colin's doing is, is taking another period and applying it to the present, whether it's you know, more Munich inspired rather than, than Paris, and Alistair in being able to, to actually find the perfect, pitch perfect way of working with people who are both classically trained and also who don't read music and to be able to never ever giving a sense of why can't you read music or why can't you listen better, just absolutely making it all work. Those are some of the conditions that are necessary to make a collaboration happen. And so I think, you know, um, my, one of my favorite ways of thinking about creativity, cultural creativity or, or any kind of creativity, is not from what humans do, but from nature. And, and it's the term edge effect, where in, in ecology, uh, when two different ecosystems meet, like the savanna and the forest, what happens in the life forms at the edge, at the intersections? You have, um, you have the least density of life at the edge, but you have the most forms of new life. And to me, that's a perfect uh, you know, uh, metaphor that we can take from nature. And in your case, you applied it to uh, a specific work, looking at the preconditions and all the people that are going to be creating new work around the same kinds of preconditions. Uh, you know, uh, music, film, or dance, and 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 to so that we can do better thinking in whatever field we're in, and to say, okay, well, what are your edges? What are your intersections? What are our things that? What are you going to do in Illinois, in terms of finding a particular intersection that suits the ecosystem? of that place for which you are music director. Well, we're opening, ne opening next season with the Rite of Spring, so. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and you can talk about that and bringing in what you've done or what we're talking about today to a different community and say, well, consider this. This is another option. Thank you, wow. Um, <laughs> So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, one of the, the very exciting things for us about this whole project is that these pieces aren't going to end with their performances and their premieres in Chapel Hill. Uh, they're going to live on elsewhere, and of course we hope for many years. I know that you all are going to take not just work for the Silk Road Ensemble, but for Brooklyn Rider and perform them elsewhere. And I think for us in Chapel Hill, it's, a, it's part of the pride that we have in helping invest in, this, in these works to hopefully shape the future in many, I think, the same ways that you know, you've said so articulately. Um, again, I think we're, we don't have time to go through all of this, and um, I could sit here all day with all of you, um, even with a beer maybe in hand. And um, I want to just thank them because they have to go back to rehearse. As, as you may know, they have another concert tonight. Um, and uh, these working artists have, have things to do. Uh, so if you can just join me in thanking these three for being with us today, thank you. Thank you.